So yeah, as we get started, what are you, do you find yourself the most passionate about right now? Getting focused actually. Um, you know, I, 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 like many entrepreneurs, I have lots of interests in doing lots of things. I'm also a big helper. And so I'm really finding myself backing up and coming central centered around what I need to be doing. So you mentioned I chair the commission on aging. I actually just turned in my resignation, had mm -hmm. not intended to do that, but I need to get focused because our company is in a uh, growth trajectory that's really, really important. And so I'm having to kind of back up and get focused. So for me right now, that's really um, is not getting fragmented with all the other noise and trying to, to hone in on what we need to be doing. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds really important right now. Yeah. Yeah. Can you take us back to the very beginning of starting aging is cool and kind of where did, where did the original inspiration come from? What, how did it start? Yeah. So, um, as Liz mentioned, I've worked with older adults for about 35 years, mostly in the nonprofit sector. My husband is a fitness instructor and had been working with seniors as well. And we just realized that the programs that we were seeing in senior living and senior centers were kind of dumb. They were kind of dumbed down. You know, it's a lot of bingo. It was a lot of coloring books. It was a lot of really simplified things. And we just realized that we wanted to create smarter, more engaging program for older, for older people. I'm 53. I don't want to play bingo. I want to continue to learn and have purpose and engage and create things and start businesses and do whatever. And I know people in their 80s, 90s and up that are doing that. So we wanted to be part of that. Um, so we provide recreational activities for older adults. We take them into senior living communities. Um, but that's not actually how we started. So we sort of had this concept of what we wanted to do. And then we started really simply. The first thing we did was a summer camp for seniors of all things. Um, that <laughs> no one else at the time was doing. Um, and we did it for about three years only to learn that we weren't making any money at it. We were losing money constantly. <laughs> it was just not, but we knew it was a piece. Again, it was that, that like learning as we go, that sort of what's important, you know, what were we trying to do? The mission was active aging. And what, what did that look like? Um, so from there, we went to this kind of membership model where we charged older adults, 30 bucks a month. They had, you know, 15 or 20 activities that, that they could come to. We rented space and gyms and uh, meeting rooms and all of that. And again, found that it wasn't financially viable. It was really, really hard to find older adults, to market to older adults, to get them to pay for it. And somewhere in the mix, we started doing classes in senior living communities. So retirement communities, assisted living, uh, Alzheimer's units, those types of things. And once that started, it, it just grabbed, it made sense. It was business to business. It was an easier sell. It was um, going to activity directors that had budgets, that had the money to do what we, you know, to pay for what we were providing. Um, and, you know, it, gosh, three years ago, pre-pandemic, I think we were doing about 80 classes a month. Um, wow. At the end of this year, we'll be doing 300. Um, so it's, and we're, and, and we've expanded now um, into three states and moving into our fourth state uh, in January, moving into Florida, which is, you know, retirement capital of the world, right? So, <laughs> um, but we never thought we'd be here. We never thought we'd be here. Like we always thought we'd just be Austin based. We just do our best. We just make a living. We'd have a feel good job. We wouldn't have to work for anybody else. Um but we've kind of gone with the flow and we've built relationships and we've reinvented ourselves many, many times. Um, COVID destroyed us. We, we shut down for two years completely. We we're completely in live programming. Um, and so again, we pivoted and reinvented and went back to what we knew and tried online programming, all kinds of things, you know, but we, it has not stayed static in the slightest. It has been different every year at every turn and sometimes every three months it's something new but it's totally different that's awesome thank you for sharing all that yeah i think i was the most amazed by your comeback after the pandemic because that was such a full-on like stop like there's no way you can do what you're doing like the end and then you yeah. had to figure out what to do next and um 
it's I think it's such a misnomer that we have is about entrepreneurship that you have to find a way to do it and just keep repeating it like as if that's always going to work right and so often you have all these huge factors that you can't control like the pandemic um really it's your skill of adapting to that right that allows you to keep going like what do you think is what do you think are some of the biggest things that helped you over the years to to adapt you know as you're growing or changing the business I, I think just always being curious about what that next thing might be, you know, and not being stuck on the one model, um, being really, really open to conversations, you know, so, and I've mentored with Liz and Ben multiple times. And what I usually talk about is relationship building and, mm -hmm. and never saying no to coffee and all of that kind of stuff. And for me, it's always about being really open to, um, every connection, every possibility, um, sitting and listening, not being afraid to partner with other people, you know, not getting so stuck on this is my model or my thing. You know, half of what we've been able to accomplish is in partnership with other people. Our expansion into these new states is a partnership with another corporation that, you know, we didn't see coming, you know, that I never would have even considered it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just being really open to that all the time. Um, and you just, you know, sometimes you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I mean, that's <laughs> you know, I, the, yeah. the, day, the day COVID hit, our phone rang and we had, you know, 60, 70 calls and we lost all of our business in one day. Every senior living community called us and said, we're locking down. You can't come in here. And they shut down for two years. We couldn't even set foot in the door. Um, and it was our entire model, our entire model. And so we had to really think differently. And we very quickly had to learn like everybody else, right? You know, we're not the only ones, but learn how to use Zoom, learn how to create online programming. We created newsletters for seniors that would keep them, you know, have something to, so they'd have something to do during the day because they couldn't leave their rooms. You know, we had to get really creative about what else we could offer. Um, and then somehow not be afraid to bring it back again. Right. Because <laughs> very easily, we very easily could have said, screw this and walk away. No more of that. Yeah. We're all done. Yeah. Yeah. The heartache was horrific. Again, I know, I know we weren't the only ones, but it was, it was horrific and it was scary. And to be able to go, okay, let's try again. And then it come back gangbusters because now there was this new interest in people being connected. Right? Yeah. Now it's even more, yeah. more focused than it was before. Yeah. We knew, we know more about social isolation. We know about the value of that, of the interactions and all of that. And so to bring that all back, um, so that resilience of, getting knocked down and getting back up again. It's, really important. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. It's so amazing. Ro what role do you think community plays as you evolve? You know, you talked a little bit about partnerships and collaboration. Is that, you know, how, can you tell us a little bit about how that's worked for you in terms of finding avenues for this to work and succeed? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's really, really massive for us, that partnership piece, you know, whether it's in our, um, for example, on our nonprofit side, we're working on a grant right now that's in collaboration with six other nonprofit agencies so that we'll be able to support their clients with our services. Um, our expansion into other states has been based on a model with a company that um, has independent living communities all over the country. And because we worked with one of them and we provided really good customer service, all of a sudden they said, oh, we don't like our other vendor. Would you like to come with us for this and this and this? And when they said, you know, we've got a couple of places in Vegas. Have you ever thought about expanding outside of Austin? I went, uh, okay, <laughs> sure. And she said, do you think you can make it work? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we can. I don't know. Um, so we took on the challenge and because of that we figured out how to do it and now we know how to scale and so when they came and said do you want the phoenix market as well then it was like of course we do you know when she said do you want the florida market next year we're like of course we do nice because we, we took the risk um but yeah i think those partnerships and relationships are are everything 
you know, that's where our referrals come from. That's where um, our word of mouth about the, what we do comes from, mm -hmm. you know, is the, those relationships and those uh, partnerships. That's fantastic. So what advice do you have um, for folks that are, you know, nurturing their ventures after they get them off the ground? I know this group is in various stages of either ideation into execution and, and really demoing their concepts. What advice do you have for them? Uh, don't get stuck. You know, don't get stuck in what you thought it was supposed to be. Um, I have circled back so many times, my poor husband, every year, I think I say, we should do the summer camp thing again. <laughs> <laughs> and every year he says to me, are you insane? <laughs> like, it, because it didn't work. It was, it, but it, it, it felt good and it was so fun. And it was like everything. And like, we got really great media, like internationally, we, like we had coverage in Japan. I mean, it, it was this so cool idea. Um, nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. Mm. Um, and so just because you think it's a brilliant idea and you're in love with it, it may not be the way that people want it. And so really listening and iterating over and over and running those tests and running those surveys and running, you know, asking the questions, is this working? Is this what people want? Um, and actually asking the people, I have to say, I'm really still guilty about that. I don't, I, I don't do the surveying I should. I don't ask my staff like I should. I, and it's just because we get so caught up sometimes in, in um, the day to day. But I think that listening process of, um, you know, what did you think about that? Do you like the product? Is it helpful to you? Would you pay that kind of money for it? And I think some of us get stuck in the fear of like, we don't want to hear the negativity or we don't want to ha have somebody say, no, I actually think that's a dumb idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that we have to, you know, we have to listen to that and we have to be really open to that. Um, mm -hmm. But don't think for a minute that what you're trying to create now is what you will be in. We're on, we're going into our eighth year at, we're nothing, nothing like we were before. And, and many times people still come up to me and they're like, oh, you're the girl that runs the summer camps. Like that's all they know about us. It's like, no, <laughs> we, we don't do that. We haven't done that in ages and ages, you know? Oh, well then you're the one that does the membership program. Nope. We haven't done that in ages <laughs> and ages. Um, we're different, you know, and to be okay with that, um, to get to land in the right space, you have to be okay with that. Yeah, to okay with iterating and not just saying, "Well, we we're sticking to this," and if it's if it's not that, then it's a failure. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. And we had a business fail actually during the pandemic. Um, I uh, myself and a couple of colleagues built a website that we thought was going to be the end all be all of everything for senior activities. We worked really, really, really hard for three years on it, and it turned out that people didn't want it. Um, and we were never able to make a penny on it. We never mm -hmm. made a penny. Um, and we thought it was everything. Like <laughs> it was the best idea. Nobody else was doing it. Gonna be life changing, world changing. And we shut it down about three months ago. Um, it just, it wasn't. Um, and, you yeah. know, partially because we weren't listening. Partially because we weren't listening. Yeah. It's really easy not to. Yeah. <laughs> it's really easy. Yeah. Just get in your own little tunnel mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a it's a website i wanted to have but it doesn't mean that anybody else <laughs> it. doesn't mean that the market wanted it yeah. yeah the market didn't want it the market wasn't paying for it um and fun it was, hobby yeah yeah it was a fun hobby for three years <laughs> a lot Super of money fun. in it a lot of money so spent. much fun yeah so much fun <laughs> nice. well before we wrap up this piece of the conversation are there any other tips you have for us around how we can embrace you know, iterating or pivoting in our concepts as we're going. So this is, this is the dry piece of it. I think I, and this probably comes out of my nonprofit background. I still said, sit down and do a strategic plan every year. And it's really helpful to me to sit down and look at like, what happened this past year? What did I learn? What do I, you know, where do I want to go? What changes do I need to make? What new relationships do I have? I still do that every year. I don't necessarily do it with a team, but at least for myself, I sit down and do some sort of strategic work. And it, it helps me to get, to stop and look at things kind of objectively 
um, as to where we've been and where we want to go. And so I would really encourage um, that even though that can feel like a dry process and maybe unnecessary, when you get really rolling with your business, you don't take time to do strategy. You don't take time to sit down and do that. And so you have to make yourself um, do that because otherwise you're going to get caught up. I mean, I have 50 employees. I run HR, I run billing, I run the website, I do all our marketing. I mean, it'd be very easy just to get trapped in that cycle and never sit down and just actually get up above it and try and really look at where we are. And I think that's been helpful to me because that's when I write down like, okay, this is working, but this one isn't. So let's get rid of this, this next year. You know, this is, you know, this is a new relationship. I need to leverage that. Let's, you know, I need to follow up on that more and put some energy into that. Um, if I didn't do that, I would get so lost in um, just kind of this constant churn of, you know, trying to make money, right? We're all trying to make money. We're all trying to yeah. live and pay the bills and get by. And you can get really caught up in that. Um, but you do have to take time to plan. So I would say that would be another another suggestion. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, this is wonderful to uh, hear the latest iteration of what you're doing and just to hear your wisdom on everything. Um, after this, we're going to take a minute to do some journaling, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A with you. Um, before we do that, we, you know we like to ask our mentors, what can the group do for you? Oh, goodness. You know, I don't even know these days. I used to have <laughs> really good answers about that. I mean, I think, you know, for me, we're, we consider ourselves, you know, a social venture, right? We, we, the reason we do our business is because we want to change the world. And one of the big things around that um, for us is sort of being anti-ageist. And so really for me these days, it's just sort of about challenging people to look at their own views around aging and ageism. Um, I, there's been some stuff in the media recently that especially around the president, right? And it's not political, but it's around that, you know, oh, he's too old and these people are too old. And there's there was a cover, I, I can't even remember which magazine it was, but it's got, you know, Biden with a walker. And, you know, if we were to mock people with disabilities like that on the cover of a magazine, or if we were to mock black people, or if we were to mock, you know, it, religions like that, it, there would be an uproar. But because we mocked people who were old, it's okay. And it's actually not okay. And so I just would challenge you to think about that. So, you know, go out there and change the world. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the, it's one of the isms that we need to get rid of. Right. So, nice. um, you know, so that, that would be a way that you could help in the world and that would make me feel good. So. <laughs> okay, good. That's a good challenge. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Amy. Um,